Well, thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining Contagion. Well, thank you. So if you could just start us, we're going to get into some vaccine news. Could you start us with your background and a bit about the firm? Yeah, great. I'll be happy to. So uh, my name is Jeff Wolf. I'm the founder and CEO of Heat Biologics. Um, I formed Heat Bio uh, about a decade ago uh, to really focus on developing this very novel uh, platform, vaccine platform, that can be used against uh, oncology as well as uh, host of infectious diseases. And so, uh, and, and that's really what we've been uh, focused on as a company. Our fi- primary focus has been oncology, and, but we've also used this platform against, uh, with our collaborators against uh, the Zika virus, against malaria, against HIV, uh, all with Department of Defense and NIH funds, and, you know, seen really great results. So when COVID came around, we, we decided, well, let's, uh, let's really use this powerful platform to uh, take on COVID-19 as, as a powerful practice prophylactic. But before founding Heat, I founded several other uh, biotechnology companies, uh, including, uh, I was a co-founder of a company called Avigen, then Eleusis Therapeutics, Tyrex, um, and uh, and then Heat. So uh, really my background goes back to to really forming biotech companies from scratch based on really interesting cutting-edge research at universities. Great to hear. Can you tell us a bit more about the platform for vaccine development you brought up? Great. Well, this is this is a really powerful and very unique platform technology. And it all really starts with a protein called GP96. Now, GP96 is what's known as a chaperone protein. It's in all of our cells. And its function in the cell is to fold all, all of the other proteins in the cell and place uh, peptides on the cell surface. Now, in the natural state, when cells die via necrosis or unnatural cell death, it releases this GP96 while it's forming all of, while it's folding all of the proteins in the cell. And the GP96 has uh, evolved over time with our immune system to become known as a danger associated molecular protein or DAM. And what that simply means is when the, when the immune system sees it, it goes into high alert and it says, says basically, uh, you know, there's a problem here because we shouldn't be seeing GP96. We're going to mount a T cell response against all of these peptides that the GP96, uh, GP96 is folding, all of the non-self peptides. And that's what makes it such a robust, um, way to activate T cells against viruses. And there was a lot of work done on GP96 in the 90s at Sloan Kettering. And what they found is GP96 is actually the primary activator of T cells due to necrotic cell death. Now, one can imagine that this this pathway could be a very important pathway against oncology. If you could activate T cells against cancer cells, uh, you you can potentially destroy cancer cells, as well as infectious diseases as well. Because if you could identify um, uh, um, proteins that are associated with uh, certain viruses, you could activate uh, T cells against those as well. So um, at University of Miami, there was a scientist named Eckhart Podak. He was, he was a great immunologist. He passed away a few years ago, who had a, a really very elegant and simple idea. And that is to take GP96, uh, 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 transfect it into a cell, the leashless form of the GP96, to create cells that are constantly secreting GP96, as well as all of the, um, as, as all of the uh, uh, proteins associated with, uh, w- with the cancer. So what we do is we, uh, for cancer, what we do is we secrete GP96 uh, as as well as all of the markers associated with uh, all of the antigens associated with cancer, um, with, with that particular cancer type. In not in infectious disease, we're secreting GP96 plus all of the antigens, or or in the case of uh, coronavirus, portions of the spike protein 
that are associated with the with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so we create a very uh, active way to activate T cells against anything we want in oncology as well as infectious disease. So that's really the platform we use. And what we're injecting patients with is this, GP, this uh, these cells, human cells that are continually secreting GP96 along with uh, regions of uh, portions of the spike protein. So it's a very, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very unique approach. There's no one else doing it, but we've tested our, um, our approach in over uh, 300 patients already uh, in, um, in oncology. And what we found is we activate T cells, we activate T cells robustly, robustly. And in the case of lung cancer, the T cells we activate actively invade the lung and destroy cancer cells within the lung, which is exactly where, where you want to get to with a respiratory virus like COVID-19. Well, that's, that's really fascinating. And this is actually something I've heard before too. This comparison has come up between oncology and not just COVID, but virology, but, but, but specifically, especially with COVID. And do you see SARS-CoV-2 uh, as having anything particularly in that regard? Or do you feel more like what we're seeing here is just the crossover between how cancer immunity works and how viral immunity works cellularly? You know, there, there are common features of both. Um, you know, uh, our immune system, T cells in our immune system are constantly destroying mutated cells or mutated cells that have the potential to become uh, cancerous cells. And so in the same way that they're destroying viruses that contain, uh, uh, that, that T cells are destroying cells that contain viruses. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, you have T cells activated against cancer and T cells activated against, um, against uh, uh, cancer cells, against cells that contain viruses. But um, yeah, I mean, I think there is a common feature in both in that you're actively activating the immune system against, uh, and the T cell arm of the immune system primarily against, uh, against uh, uh, things you don't want. Now, do you think that other vaccine candidates are producing the kinds of T cell response that we'd look for? I know that in this kind of you could call it a race for a vaccine, but we're likely to see more than one approved, really. But I do wonder, is there enough emphasis on cellularly mediated immunity? Are, are people seeing enough results there with the candidates that are uh, getting a lot of attention uh, and getting a lot of funding? Uh, are, are we seeing what we want to see there? You know, I, I think I think the... Bottom line is, uh, we don't know. I think the, the data is insufficient at this point. So initially, um, you know, the focus has been on an antibody response. And the type of uh, vaccines that are out there in, and in the clinic are vaccines that have in, primarily in, in either preclinical models or in uh, act as actual human vaccines have generated historically an antibody response. Um, we don't know whether that antibody response is going to be enough. Um, what we do know or, is that uh, it's becoming clear that uh, T cell uh, immunity is uh, likely quite important for uh, COVID-19. What we do is we activate T cells and we, and we do it very well. Uh, we activate CD4 T cells, we activate CD8 T cells, uh, as part of this, as part of this pathway, we also activate a humoral response. And so we're designing our drug to be used for patients most in need, patients who are immunocompromised, who may lack the ability to generate their own T-cell immune response. Um, patients who are elderly, with th those with comorbidities. And we could use this, our vaccine, either as a standalone for those patients or add it on top of a traditional antibody vaccine to generate a, the, a very much needed uh, T cell uh, immunity and cellular immunity uh, for these patients. You know, to have them work in tandem a bit, to have it upfront 
one and then the other. How does how is that working at the immune level? You know, when SARS-CoV-2 is trying to attack my ACE2 receptors or what have you. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, I think at the immune level, you're you're likely uh, going to need both. You're going to need both an antibody response and uh, uh, T cell response. And uh, you know, I, I think in the case of T cells, it's becoming it's becoming very clear and there are recent publications out that uh, show that patients who uh, lack uh, an effective T cell response aren't generating sufficient protection. Uh, you're going to need, you're going to need to generate a robust T cell immune response. And the bottom line is, you know, we don't know what kind of T cell immune response these current vaccines in the clinic are generating. We don't know, uh, how strong it is. We don't know the longevity of that T cell response. And so it's, um, it, it's going to be an important uh, aspect of any COVID-19, especially when you're dealing with patients who are immunocompromised. And many of the current vaccines aren't even tested in elderly people uh, as part of the clinical trials. So I, I think, um, you know, at some point that uh, that's going to need to change. We've talked a bit about what the T cell based or T cell focused vaccine effort does on the immune level for an individual. As far as the overall response strategy goes, as far as population level immunity is concerned, when you have all of these issues such as vaccine hesitancy, how does a vaccine play a role in a larger response? Because I think that you can't have the vaccine conversation without kind of acknowledging one of the elephants in the room with it is people are trying to get a vaccine quickly because they want an exit strategy. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, and, you know, I guess with, with respect to the current vaccines under development, um, you know, there are certain things where we're not going to know about these vaccines uh, because of the rapid uh, way that these vaccines are moving through the clinic. We're not gonna know how long uh, these vaccines last. We're not gonna really have a good understanding of the, the percentage of patients helped or of the subgroups that the vaccines are most effective on. Um, but, but I think one thing, one thing is clear is um, that if, if you activate multiple arms of the immunity, uh, multiple arms of the immune system, you're going to have uh, a better shot at preventing the uh, the onset of COVID-19 than activating activating a single arm. And, and that's why we're designing our vaccine as um, a vaccine that could be used in combination with any approved vaccine. 